My name is Rick Renner, and today I'm in the heart of ancient Ephesus, standing in a house that has been excavated. This is a real house. This is where people lived. Husbands and wives, kids, grandparents, servants and slaves running all over the place. This really is a house where people lived in the first century. And the people in the first century were so morally confused. And where I'm standing is a great example of that because directly behind me is a Dionysiac Hall. Oh, the Dionysiac Hall is a place where vile, lewd, sexual things took place. Really twisted. We would say really perverted activities. That's what they were experiencing in the first century. Wow. Yet when the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, what we call 2 Timothy, he prophesied in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that people would become really unholy. The word unholy that is used in 2 Timothy chapter 3 really means lewd, vile, foul. And the Holy Spirit prophesied at the end of the age, people would become morally loose and morally lewd. Listen to what the Holy Spirit says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, verse 2, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, and then he says, unthankful, unholy. That word unholy really means lewd. A spirit of lewdness is going to be released into society at the very end of the age. I think you can testify Lewdness is on television. It's in music. It's in people's morals. You can see it in the way they dress, the way they joke. What once was considered to be very sacred, mm, now it's vile. It's foul. It is amazing how lewd society has become. How could it happen? Well, we should have been listening to Scripture because 2,000 years ago, the Holy Spirit prophesied this would occur at the very end of the age. And since you and I are the ones living in the very end of the age, we need to know what the Bible says. We need to know what Jesus said. We would see just before he comes. And we need to know how to survive these times. And that is what I'm gonna to talk to you about today. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insight and understanding from the Word of God. Here's Rick. Wow, we have had quite a week studying 2 Timothy chapter 3. And today we're going to finish verse 2. And we're going to really wrap it up with something amazing. You will be shocked when you see what the Holy Spirit predicted in the first century about our age. The Holy Spirit is so accurate. And you know, He didn't write anything to scare us. God's not in the business of scaring people, but he is in the business of preparing us. And God gave us all this information so that we who live in the very end of the age would be alert to what is going to happen and to make sure it doesn't become a part of our lives or our families. We can build a barricade and keep this nonsense on the outside. That's what this entire teaching is about. By the way, I'm speaking to you from my series, which is called Last Day's Survival Guide. It's 15 parts. It comes in multiple formats. You will love this. Wow, it is so loaded. It is just jam-packed with revelation. And it comes with a great study guide. The study guide is amazing. I'm so impressed with the study guide, and you will be too. This study guide has all the Greek words, the history. Look at it, page after page after page after page of information that I really worked hard and to get, and I put it in this study guide for you. It is really a treasure. You will love it. Go to our website and look up all of our study guides. You'll be amazed at how many resources are there for you. It's all for you, my friends. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 10, 21, the lips of the righteous feed many. We believe that's our assignment, to feed many. So all those resources are there for you. Right now, we're also offering you my book, which is called Signs you'll see just before Jesus comes. I love this book. I just flipped through the pages of it today. Oh, this book is so filled with insight about the times in which we live. And in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus really enumerated the signs we would see that would let us know where we are on the prophetic journey to the end of the age. And they're all in this book. You will love this book. Order your copy today. But today, 
We're going to go right back to 2 Timothy chapter 3. I have my Bible. Do you have your Bible? You have to have your Bible when you watch this program because we believe in the Bible and that's what we teach. But today we're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1. But I'm going to begin today by reading the RIV of this verse. My translation of 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1 says, You emphatically and categorically need to know with unquestionable certainty that in the very end of days when time has sailed to its last port and no more time remains for the journey, that last season will stand in the midst of uncontrollable, unpredictable, hurtful, treacherous, menacing times that will be emotionally difficult for people to bear. Now you may say, Rick, how did you come up with that translation? By going into the Greek and pulling out the meaning of the Greek words. For example, in chapter 3 and verse 1, where Paul says this, know also. He inserts the little Greek word day, which describes something that is emphatic or something that is categorical. The word know that is used here, the tense means this is something that must be known. It must be recognized. It must be acknowledged. So I've translated it. You emphatically and categorically need to know with unquestionable certainty that at the end of days. Why do I translate it at the end of days? Because in Greek, it is the Greek word eschatos. And the word eschatos describes the very ultimate end of a thing. The extreme end, what is final, the very end. So the Holy Spirit is describing what's going to happen in the end of days. And he says, in the end of days, when you can sail no further in time, why do I translate it like that? Because the word eschatos was also the very Greek word used in a navigational sense to describe the last port for a ship. When the ship could sail no further, that last port was called eschatos. That's the word that is used in this verse, translated last. It's describing the very end, the ultimate end, what is final, the last port, when you can sail no further. The Bible says perilous times will come. The word perilous is the Greek word which describes danger, hurt, or risk, something that is wounding, it was used in Greek literature to predict wild, vicious, uncontrollable animals that were unpredictable and dangerous, a deadly menace. It denoted anything that was treacherous or potentially harmful or ugly words which when spoken were hurtful and emotionally hard to bear or any action, place, person or thing that is harsh, harmful or filled with high risk. That's why I've translated it. You will stand in the midst of uncontrollable, unpredictable, hurtful, treacherous, menacing times, which are dif emotionally difficult for people to bear. That's what verse 1 really means. And the Bible says these times shall come, shall come, again is the Greek word in istomy. The word en means to be in. The word histomy means to stand. When you compound the two words together, it means to stand in the very middle of something, to be surrounded by something, even to be encumbered by something, it depicts anything that you are standing in the middle of. So the Holy Spirit says when you've come to the end of the age, you will feel like you're surrounded with perilous times. Do you feel that? When you look at what's happening in your neighborhood, in your church, in the lives of people you know, what's happening in politics around the world, does it feel like you're surrounded with perilous times? The Holy Spirit says that is one of the key signals to let you know that you are the one living in the very end of the age. You'll feel you're surrounded by it and there is no escape from it. And my friends, it is our opportunity to rise and shine. We're appointed for this. We're anointed for this. God chose me. Think about that. All the people that could have lived in our age, Prophets prophesied about this time we're living in, and we are the ones chosen to live in it. And we're anointed by God. We have the word of God. We have the authority that Jesus has given to us, and we can do this. We can sail through these waters victoriously and even bring the life-saving message of Jesus to other people that have been hurt by this age. But wait, when you come to verse 2, Paul begins to list the characteristics of, of an end time lost society. See if this sounds like the world we're living in today. Look at what it says in verse two. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. This is this very bizarre Greek word, the word philautos, from the word philos, which is the Greek word for love. It means to love, to be fond of. It denotes fondness, attraction, 
or a romantic feeling that you normally would feel for someone else. But in this particular case, it's connected to the word autos. The word autos describes one's self. When you compound these two words together, the phrase lovers of their own self, the Greek word philautos means love of self and actually describes an inordinate self-love, self-preoccupation, one in love with and consumed with himself, self-absorbed, self-focused, it is an inordinate self-love, or the first sign of an end-time society is it will have misdirected love, and coming out of that, it will be covetous. The word covetous describes extreme covetousness, taking care of oneself before anyone else, making all of his decisions based on himself and his own comfort, and finally, Paul says in verse 2, people will become boasters. The word boasters is the Greek word alexon. This word alexon is such a description of our age. It describes one so committed to his own self-promotion and personal agenda that he's willing to exaggerate, overstate the facts, stretch the truth, embellish a story, and even lie if it will have a positive effect on his position or situation or agenda. Wow. It really is describing the day of situational ethics where people change their story, make up a story, say whatever they have to say to promote their agenda or their ideology. Does that sound like the day in which we live? And Paul says, furthermore, they will become proud. These people who are promoting their own agenda, changing their story, saying whatever they have to say, to promote what they believe and the agenda they want to set for everybody else from their lofty position, they will become proud, which is the Greek word hooper, raphanas, from the word hooper, which means to be above or to be superior, and the word phanos, which means manifested. But when you compound the two words together, they form a single word, which paints the picture of a person who sees himself as being above the rest of the crowd, one who is arrogant, haughty, high and mighty, impudent. He has an insolent attitude. One who thinks he is intellectually advantaged above others. And in this word, the Holy Spirit portrays a person or a group of people who see themselves as being above the rest of the crowd. And really in this verse, we see the media, we see politics, we see education, we see the court, those who snootily vaunt themselves as the new vanguards of a new society that they are creating for the rest of us. They're proud. They think they're higher or more intellectually advantaged than everybody else. And from their lofty, snooty position, oh, it's amazing, the Bible says they will be blasphemers. The word blasphemeo is the word in Greek. And here's what it means to slander, to accuse to speak against, to speak derogatory words for the purpose of injuring or harming one's reputation. It signifies profane, foul, unclean language. It can refer to blaspheming the, the divine, but in general, it is any derogatory speech intended to defame, injure, or harm another's reputation. The broader meaning includes any type, any type of debasing, derogatory, nasty, shameful, ugly speech or behavior intended to humiliate someone else. In other words, the Holy Spirit says those who think they're more intellectually advantaged above everybody else, they will lose their position to defame anyone who stands in the way of their ideology. Manners will be thrown to the wind and people will become filthy in the way they speak. It even includes foul language and in the horrible, uncivil things they say about other people. The Holy Spirit prophesied this would take place in the very last season of this age. But wait, that's not all. It goes on to say, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. The word disobedient is the Greek word apathes. And as I told you in the previous program, it is from the word patho. And that is very important because the word patho means to persuade or to convince. But when you put an A on the front of it, the word patho becomes apathes. Apathes means they're no longer leadable. They're no longer persuadable. It's been canceled. It depicts 
those that are unpersuadable, uncontrollable, or unleadable. It means no longer able to persuade, control, lead, or exercise authority over. It depicts a total loss of control, a lack of ability to persuade or to lead. And in this particular verse, the word apathes is used in connection with parents. It depicts parents losing the ability to lead their own children, losing the ability to exercise authority over their own children in their own home. Rather than lead as authority figures in their home, many parents will begin to negotiate with their kids because kids have been so empowered. And this all goes back to point number one in verse two, which is self-love. Self-love, they're the center of themselves. I have the right to do what I want to do. No one has the right to tell me what to do. Self-love, this is so evil that it knocks everything off balance. But wait, in verse two, it goes on to say unthankful, unthankful. The word unthankful is the Greek word akaristos. This is profound. It comes from the word charis. The word charis is the Greek word for grace. But when the word charis becomes charistos, it describes a thankful attitude, an appreciative attitude, or a grateful attitude. But if you put an A on the front of it, that A cancels it, and it pictures a person or a group of people who were once thankful, but who now have become unappreciative and unthankful or entitled. <laughs> is that amazing? That is amazing. The word unthankful, the word akaristos, which is used in this verse, tells us that a thankful attitude that previously prevailed will be replaced with an ungrateful, unappreciative attitude. People would develop a sense of entitlement. Society at the very end of the age will believe it is entitled to everything. You know, when you're entitled to everything, then you're not thankful for anything because you think that you're just entitled to have it. This really cancels thankfulness and gratefulness. Wow, that is what the Bible says will happen at the very end of the age in society. People who have an entitlement mentality feel they have a right to possess something or to have the privilege of something. They think everybody owes them something and in fact, if they don't have what you have, it makes them angry because they think they're also entitled to have it. It's really the pinnacle of covetousness, which is what belongs to those who have extreme self-love. You see how all these are so connected to each other? It's amazing. And entitlement mentality focuses on taking, not giving. Many younger adults today, you know that this is true immediately feel they should have the lifestyle and the possessions that it took their parents many years to build without paying for it or waiting for it. It is a hallucination very far from reality. But just as the Holy Spirit said today, it is prevailing in society. And let me tell you, where there is unthankfulness, it also leads to unholiness. You need to get my book called How to Keep Your Head on Straight in a World Gone Crazy and especially read chapter 2 which is about swimming upstream in a downstream world. This world is so messed up. We need to keep our heads on straight. But what you're going to find when you read this book is that where people are unthankful, they also become unholy. These two things are absolutely connected. You see, when you're thankful, you're looking to God, you're grateful. But when you're unthankful, you're no longer looking up, you're not looking to God. People become unappreciative. They begin to feel entitled. And the Bible says it leads to unholiness. The word unholiness that is used in this verse is the Greek word anosios from the word hosios, which depicts a people or group of people that are reverent, respectful, or God-fearing. But when you put an A on the front of the word, that A cancels it, which means that which was once holy has become unholy. That which was once reverent has become irreverent. That which was once God-fearing has lost its fear of God. It can be translated irreverent or disrespectful. It depicts those who have lost the fear of God and whose way of thinking and outward actions have become, listen to this, ill-mannered, impure, unclean, lewd, indecent, crude, coarse, vulgar, offensive, and rude. Or it's people who earlier on were respectful of holy things, 
They were reverent about others, reverent about life. But now their thinking has become unholy, unsacred, impure. It depicts an entire society that has become ill-mannered, improper, unclean, indecent, coarse, vulgar, offensive, rude, crude, and lewd, or a society that is filled with smut. All you have to do is watch TV every evening in your home and you will see the television is filled with smut. It is amazing that nations who once knew how to behave civil and speak respectfully, their mouths are just filled with smut. It is amazing even to see what's being portrayed on television in your home every night. Words which once were considered to be so rude. Now people just freely speak them without even thinking about it. It is just unthinkable what has happened to language and what is portrayed before people. But the Holy Spirit prophesied that where there is unthankfulness, it eventually produces an unholy attitude or society filled with smut. And now in this verse, the Holy Spirit prophesied at the end of the age, people would become unthankful, unappreciative, ungrateful, They would have a sense of entitlement and society would be filled with that which is lewd, crude, and rude. Let me translate this verse for you entirely. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. Men will be self-focused, self-centered, self-absorbed, self-consumed, and in love with themselves more than anyone else. As a result of this self-love, they will be driven to obtain more and more and more These boasters are so committed to their own agenda that they're willing to exaggerate, overstate the facts, stretch the truth, embellish a story, and even lie if it will get them the position, advantage, or goal they desire. They are arrogant, haughty, impudent, snooty, and insolent. They disdain, mock, slander, and speak ill of anyone that stands in the way of their ideology and freely use foul language. In this climate, parents will no longer be able to persuade, control, lead, or exercise authority over their own children. And although people were once thankful and appreciative, people will generally become void of gratitude and will be unappreciative of everything. Impurity will seep into society and cause it to become impure, ill-mannered, unclean, indecent, coarse, vulgar, offensive, crude, rude, and lewd. That is what 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2 means. Now, let me ask you, was the Holy Spirit accurate when he described the age in which we live? I think your answer is yes, but we don't have to fall victim to this. The Holy Spirit alerted us to this so we would be aware and we would be prepared and we could keep all this nonsense out of our lives. And that's why I'm teaching you this series. We're out of time, but I'll be back in just a moment and I'm going to pray for you. We are living in the last of the last days. That means you will see and experience bizarre developments that no other generation has witnessed. How do you protect your family, your children, and your grandchildren from the evil being spread through all media, education, Hollywood, and the courts? With the Bible at your side and the Holy Spirit as your guide, you can sidestep every landmine the enemy has planted and walk into victory. God wants you to be anointed and victorious, regardless of an ever-darkening world. But you need to know what God says about these end times. In Rick's Last Day Survival Guide, you'll learn what the Holy Spirit prophesied about the end of the age, the major signs that we are in the wrap-up of the age, steps to stay free and victorious in this end-time season. Available in digital or physical formats, starting at just $24, you'll learn how to reach inside yourself to stir up the fire of God that is in you. In addition to this teaching series, you can also get the book, Signs You'll See, Just Before Jesus Comes. Jesus said we would see signs as we approach the very last of the last days. These signs have been occurring throughout the ages, but Jesus said they would escalate as we approach the end of the age. We need to know the signs Jesus said we would see to let us know where we are in time. Don't delay in ordering your copy today for only $15. Don't miss this special offer. Last Day Survival Guide and the companion book, Signs You'll See Just Before Jesus Comes. Call now, 1-800-742-5593 or go to renner.org. Call or go online now. Today we've covered so much in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2 and we're just getting started. We've only covered two verses. There are many verses for us still to cover and they're just packed. I'm speaking to you for my series 
which is called Last Day's Survival Guide. It's 15 parts. It comes in multiple formats with a study guide. You'll just love these. It is powerful. And we're also offering you my book that I really want you to have called Signs You'll See Just Before Jesus Comes. You should buy several because this is a book you're really going to want to share with somebody else. Order your copy today. You can go online or call us right now. And for those who become partners with our ministry, we always send you a package of books as our way of saying thank you for initiating your partnership relationship with us. And together, we're taking the teaching of the Bible to people who are just praying for somebody to bring them the verse-by-verse -verse teaching of the Scripture. Together, we're helping people that are famished for the Word of God. And thank you for being a partner. We're so grateful for you. But I'm coming to an area near you. We're coming to Colorado Springs to Church for All Nations with Pastor Mark Cowart on February the 2nd. Then we're coming to Newark, Texas to Eagle Mountain International Church to be with Pastors George and Terry Pearsons on February the 9th. Cedar Springs, Michigan, City Church, Pastor Doug Bergsma on February the 15th. Then we're coming to Granville, Michigan to Resurrection Life Church to be with our friend Pastor Dwayne Vanderklok on February the 16th. You know, Denise and I only come to minister in America twice a year. So we would love to see you. Come to one of these meetings where we can shake your hand and look into your face. But please first go to our website and make sure you have the most updated information about the times and the places. What a privilege that we can be with you. Remember that if you need prayer, we're here for you. Call us. We're waiting for the phone to ring right now, or we're waiting for your email to show up in our inbox, and we'll begin praying with you. But I want to pray for you right now. Father, we thank you for the amazing Word of God. The Bible is so wonderful. Lord, we pray for a revival of the Bible in the heart of your people. And we thank you, Lord, that you love us so much. You prepared us. You told us what was coming so we could be equipped to sail through these times with victory. And we thank you for the word of God that undergirds us. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow, it's been so good. Remember Ecclesiastes 8.4, where the word of a king is, there's power. It's true. Let God's word work in your life today, and I'll see you in the next program. Rick Renner Ministries is proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ through every available media to the uttermost parts of the earth. Discover the many ways you can help us make a difference in lives around the world with the word of God. We invite you to partner with us in teaching, strengthening, and rescuing lives for the glory of God. Together, we can make a difference that will last throughout eternity.